Welcome everyone, it's March 6th. We are going to continue our conversation around composition. But first, uh, Mike thought that you may be interested in a little historical information about half title pages, which we talked about last week. I have found uh, with the first cohort, people were super into like, here's the story of how this came to be so that um, you can have a little more background. So Mike? Um, yeah, so we were talking uh, last week a little bit about the difference between um, the um, half title of a book and the title page. Um, and of course, I grabbed a book that doesn't have a half title. Um, so, but when printers, um, when print was first taking off um, in, uh, I think, the 15th century or so, um, they would have, you know, these huge stacks of their, their, their galley proofs. Uh, and they started to create title pages that listed the title of the book and the author of the book simply so that they could keep straight which stack was which stack, right? While they were in the, the, the proof making uh, process in the typesetting process. And uh, what would happen is those title pages would get all uh, dirty and, um, because they, they'd have to shuffle the stacks around and just the nature of their work, um, uh, those title pages would get fouled. And so they started to create a second title page that just had the title of the book on it and nothing else that they would call the foul title because it's there to be fouled. Um, and so uh, sometimes, uh, occasionally I, I've worked with uh, British typesetters which will still call the half title the foul title um, or the false title. So that's why those um, were created. And so um, since they had to create them anyway, they put them into the book and then they start as time went on, they would decorate them to make them more visually appealing. Um, but that's where it came from was just a simple organizational, like a post-it note today. <laughs> so that's where they came from. Thanks, Michael. Fun facts. Yes. All right, so we're now going to uh, just talk about, again, why we compose, um, why it's better to do it at this stage rather than later. Um, and then we're going to look at your homework together after those reminders. Um, and then we will uh, do some more in-class work uh, similar to last week. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Elvis. Hey, everyone. So um, as Karen said, uh, we're just gonna review quickly um, why we compose. And the idea is, is that if we apply structure um, at this early stage, so after you have received what is essentially um, the manuscript that the author is most uh, like happy with, that they're okay with this going to print um, and going into what they would call production, but we would call editorial. When you compose um, and you apply this structure, it not only aids in editing because it sort of cleans up uh, the file so that it makes it a lot easier for the editor to see issues. Um, they don't have to worry so much about like formatting and things like that because when you compose in the well-formed document workflow, we've set it up so that each word style um, does some formatting to uh, the actual text. So it makes it a lot easier for um, the editor to actually look at the file and, you know, not have to focus on those things and catch errors that they need to actually uh, be catching. And um, on top of that, the, you have the fact that applying structure allows you to take the file from Word into different uh, uh, programs um, and still keep the essential structure of what you want the book uh, to be. So the reason that we compose and the reason that we compose so early um, is because we want to make sure that, for example, um, if we're going to treat our chapter numbers in a certain way, if everything, if every chapter number is the same uh, style, then you can make one change and it applies throughout the whole book, meaning that your design goes by much quicker um, and so does typesetting, right? It's better to do it this way than to actually, you know, typeset like page by page and having to make the same exact changes over and over. Um, and 
just by thinking of that to jump into the next point, uh, you'll realize that that actually saves on um, having to correct errors later on because we have to do the same monotonous task over and over. Let's say you have to make all your chapter numbers, um, you know, a couple point sizes uh, bigger in the final files. Um, and this is just talking later on in production. If you've already applied structure, you can do that in one shot and everything's great. But if you have to do that over and over again, um, it is likely that as human beings, you know, the typesetter might, you know, make one chapter number a little bit bigger than the other or a little bit less, uh, a little bit smaller than the others. And now you've introduced um, inconsistencies. So composition um, and composition early on saves you not only time, but it also uh, saves you in dealing with errors and dealing with those uh, things. It makes the typesetting the design stage much more smoother. Uh, again, like I said, you're not uh, designing uh, and typesetting on like per page uh, basis. And also um, it helps you as you're composing, it helps you get a good understanding of the book and you might actually catch um, author errors or anything like that much earlier on. So the reason that we compose um, is for um, for these, as, among other reasons. Um, so just in case you're looking at it and you're saying, well, composition takes a lot of time, as we'll see when we actually get into com uh, composing with the SAI, um, you'll see that, um, how can I put it? it? It makes it, it makes everything else um, just eat that much easier. If you're looking at it uh, from this perspective of saying, okay, this is taking a lot of time up front, but later on, um, it's going to save me not only time, but it's going to save me uh, from having to catch errors or having to like really like do like these super checks to make sure that um, the book is as perfect um, as I want it to be. Um, another thing, just um, as a reminder, um, and I know I mentioned this briefly in the last class, when we are composing, uh, there are certain things that, the, that will be automated in the hub. So as you get your practice um, with composition, it will go by a whole lot faster um, than it will at the beginning. Like the first time you compose something, it might take you, you know, several hours to get through um, you know, to get through a manuscript, but later on you might actually be able to do it in one or two. Um, and if it's a really short book, you might be able to even do it in, you know, half an hour, uh, especially if it's not a complex uh, book. But that all takes time and practice as with most anything else um, in life. So that's just a quick review of why we're composing. And the reason we're sort of reminding you of this is because as we teach you this th these things and teach you this new sort of um, new methodology, it's, it's good to remember why we're, we're doing this. Um, so yeah, so I'll send it back to Karen because we're now going to go over our homework. Indeed. So um, at the end of the last class, we asked all of you to download the homework file, um, which was different than the file we worked on in class, but um, requested that you do a similar exercise in simply identifying what each sort of chunk of text, what job that chunk is doing. Um, and so what we're going to do now is break again into two groups. Elvis and Michael will be distributed between those two groups. And so if you can get your file, your homework file ready, we're going to start on page three, or as Mike would say, um, you can do a text search um, for, uh, for the following. I think uh, Elvis is going to put it in the chat. Um, perhaps they will say is the phrase that you can also do because depending on uh, what word version you're in, the page numbers could be different. So we're just all trying to get to the same place in the homework file. And so again, um, somewhere around page three, you will find the words perhaps they will say. And um, we're going to talk through about two pages in your small groups. And um, a lot of it is just, again, going to be about revealing your thinking behind uh, why you labeled things as you did. This is really sort of just the conceptual framework for composition in terms of learning to identify the job of different text elements um, in this file. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to break you into those two groups, unless you have questions you would like to ask while we're all together. I have resumed recording and just wanted to um, invite you guys to share a little bit about how it went in your small groups, what kind of discussions you had or disagreements or um, frustrations. Shrug. 
think Myra, right? Uh, Myra and I both, um, we, we kind of approached, um, we, we started from page one actually to do the exercise. Um, I, I, uh, when I was working in this document, I had a desperate need to, to get a sense of the overall hierarchy and structure. And I was trying to figure out what the heck the discourses were. Yeah. Uh, so once I made a decision, uh, that doesn't mean it was right, uh, about what the discourses were, then everything else seemed to kind of fall into place. And then I could look back and uh, switch back and forth and make sure that I had consistent patterns under each section called discourse, which I named chapters, basically, you know, just for my mental framing. Framing. At first, when I looked at it, I was really confused as to why there were multiple Roman numerals sequences, like one and two. That really threw me off. Yeah. Thanks, Sunny. The one thing um, that I'll comment on and your comment is that idea of um, being right, balanced with your impulse and need to organize. It's that impulse and need to organize that is, I think, sort of the, in a way, of the backbone of composition. And as long as you're consistent, which you also mentioned, I, I would think, Elvis can correct me if I'm wrong, that being right is even less important than that sort of, you, you make a decision, it's a consistent decision, um, and then you can kind of move forward with it. Um, so that's awesome. That's, that's the idea of why we're doing this is just kind of to look at a document and say like, this needs to be organized. <laughs> and um, as a project manager, again, you can do this yourself as Karen Bjork did. It'll help with costs on um, producing books in the cooperative, but you can also decide uh, this is not my jam and I have a budget and would like Elvis or someone else to do it. So just a reminder um, that you have that flexibility. Right. Any and other, sorry, just, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna hop in and confirm what uh, Karen was saying, which is when, as long as you are being consistent with uh, how you're applying the styles, um, it makes it, I don't wanna say like be wrong and just be wrong, but I do wanna say that if you are consistent, then it makes it that much easier to then like, for example, send the file to us and say, hey, look, I composed this this way, is, is this okay? Um, or even have somebody in your team that has now become you know, a composition expert um, and have them look at it and say, okay, well, actually, you know, like this, this course is actually a chapter and the other things are heads and this is why we, we split it up this way. Um, it's much easier to then just make those changes um, rather than if you were inconsistent but right about some things, then that's actually a, a worse situation to be in. So it's better to be wrong and consistently wrong than to be right some of the time and then just being inconsistent with the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'll send it back to Karen. And I'll send it back to you guys. Any other uh, takeaways from your homework and, and working together in these small groups? Are you getting it? You feel like you, you, you understand the concept? nods or shakes and now we're going to learn how to actually mark it up yes okay myra has seen the future so um <laughs> now that we've kind of laid this foundation in terms of like the conceptual act of composing a document um, based on how you think the author intends it to be organized or your conversations with the author about how it should be organized um, we're going to start drawing the connections to the scribe add-in tool and using that tool to compose documents. So you've kind of just been doing it freeform based on your thought process, your, all of your years of experience reading books, and now we're going to sort of translate that um, foundation into the actual uh, technical work of um, marking up a document. So first, uh, just kind of to show you um, how, how it works. We have an example for you that you um, probably came across in your reading. Um, Elvis, do you want to share your screen with it or um, I can do that too if you're not, if you don't have it. Yeah, I think that was um, Mike. Mike is going to talk about the, oh, great. The, the, we're talking about the PDF sample, right? Yes, thank you. Yes. That's right. Uh, Mike, we are now going to talk about the <laughs> what makes air hot um, composed typeset uh, demo so that we can identify uh, textbook elements that we have been talking about 
um, with how they um, come to act in the finished experience. Over to you, Mike, currently muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. All right. So um, this is sort of like a sneak preview of what uh, composed, what we can do with a properly composed file once we get it into typesetting. So um, this you'll recognize as, yes, this is obviously a textbook. This is what a textbook looks like. Um, we have our lesson two our, uh, uh, as our chapter number, even though it's called lesson because it's a textbook, um, even though that's not labeled. Our chapter title, what makes our hot. Uh, our A head, technically our A head aft because it's after, it's the directly following uh, chapter title, um, which is our first level head. Um, our teacher background knowledge, which are BH aft because it's a BH, a, a B head uh, underneath uh, an A head directly following it. That's why it gets that aft designation. Um, so, whereas, so this and this are both C level heads, right? So CHs. Um, this one, even though in the instance of clarity, it's not labeled in the PDF. This is a CH aft because it's directly following the BH aft. Um, as we see here, paragraph first, it's flush left. There's no other special treatment. Um, and so the PF, the paragraph first, renders the same as the P aft, which is the paragraph following after head. So in this particular design, the PF and the PF render exactly the same in the end result, but it's important for us to compose them as different because they might not have, depending on how the book was designed, because they are doing different jobs. Um, it just so happens that in this particular design, we can convey the information of those different jobs uh, to the reader in the same way. Uh, all right. Stop me. Before Michael continues, yes. I, I just want to give an example of something um, where like PF and PF might be different. Uh, we've actually had books where the PF will not have the, um, the initial indent, uh, but the PFs do. Um, so if we went ahead and like compose like, okay, you know, this first paragraph um, is part of, you know, is a, is a PF, then we would have had to go in and actually insert that indent uh, or recompose, right? Which would be the right way to do it. Um, so there are reasons for this where sometimes some elements look like they'll be the exact same, but the structure, what they actually are, are actually completely different. And that's why we have to look a bit beyond just what something will um, actually render as or what something uh, looks like. I'm also going to chime in and acknowledge that we are now starting to learn a new language, hearing such right. terms as A head and uh, P aft and things like that. And sometimes that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but we do have a shortened list of these terms that primarily show up in textbooks. And we do expect that this is a learning curve. And so as you work on projects, there will be back and forth um, with Elvis, uh, the project manager who knows all of these uh, by the back of his hand and can sort of um, give uh, feedback as you work on these. So I just don't want it to seem like um, you're gonna like come away from this hour um, having mastered all of these uh, different labels and a new language. Language in finger quotes. Okay, Michael. All right. Um, yeah, so just to continue on with our little sample here, um, we ha here have um, a list, um, what's well, sometimes called a bulleted list or an unnumbered list, because it doesn't have numbers. Um, so in SCML, this would be UL for unnumbered list. And down here we would have a, a B head and a C, C head after a B head. 
because uh, again, the hierarchy is preserved. Uh, and then we have an element of a numbered list, which Adobe isn't letting me select. Um, and notice this numbered list is set up so that it has bulleted list elements underneath each numbered list element. And so that is when we would start to get into uh, the UL1 for the unnumbered list sublevel one. Oh. Okay, so that's why that's uh, labeled as UL1. And over here on the recto page, uh, which is the right hand page, um, uh, we type setters take recto and, and verso from Latin because uh, we're old fashioned about some of our jargon. Um, here we have yet a lo lower level of head in the hierarchy, which is a D head. Um, right, and so then that after it would be another P aft, a paragraph after a head. Uh, and then here we have some boxed text. So um, uh, I believe it was in the breakout group, uh, Nathan was asking about uh, different sections in a, uh, in a textbook. This is a good example of um, these sort of sections that you can imagine in a textbook that has a lab associated with it. There would be safety guidelines uh, anytime students have to do something. And so those would all be separated out so they look slightly different from the text surrounding them, but they look the same across the entire textbook. Uh, and so we would style, in this case, um, these as box elements. This would be a box head, which in SCML is BXH. And this would be uh, a box paragraph after head for BX aft. Um, so you'll see the same patterns showing up again and again. Um, one of the reasons why uh, Elvis and I can remember so many SML styles is because we know the patterns by which they're named. Um, we had talked, at least in my breakout group, we talked a long time about the table. Uh, so here we get to see uh, table column head in action right, the labels, the columns. We get to see the table data. Um, this all would be paragraph style, which in this PDF is shown as in red, table data. Uh, and then each of these uh, row heads would be styled as a character style as a table row head. Everyone following along so far? Uh, and I don't know, how, how far do we want to go down this? There's this full um, sample. Uh, like here we have a sidebar, which is sidebar is um, pulled out differently because in this particular design, it has the green background, um, but it would be start, oh, these, I'm just saying story and uh, sidebar and it's actually labeled as a story story yes so so uh, yeah well I think this is really helpful I want to be sure that we have enough time for um, people to experiment right. in in class yes um, this uh, PDF that uh, Michael was talking you through is in our canvas module so you can use it uh, as a cheat sheet if you will or as another point of reference if you like, since there are so many um, textbook elements included there. So thank you. Um, okay, now we're going to um, transition, unless there are any questions for Michael about what he just talked through. Okay. Sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, we're going to transition uh, to using the scribe add-in and what you need for composition. Um, Elvis is going to demonstrate that. Again, we're moving from the more conceptual to the more practical 
Um, and then uh, we're going to hopefully have um, a good chunk of time left to go into breakout rooms again so that you can start playing with the scribe add-in and practice um, referencing the SCML list, which will um, then set you up for success on your homework. So um, over to you, Elvis. Okay, perfect. Um, and so I'd like to start with just the idea that um, scribe markup language is um, language, right? It's um, the way that you can think of it is you're learning new ways to call things that you already know, you know, by a different, by a different name. If you look at the, actually, I'll share my screen uh, from now. Let's go over to here. If you look at our SML list, it is incredibly large, um, and there are incredibly long, and there's um, a lot, right? Like I can keep scrolling if, if you guys would like, um, but. Um, as I was mentioning in the breakout rooms, we're not supposed to memorize this. Um, like Mike and I are, are able to sort of just say, oh, that's, a, that's an SL, that's a sense line, because we've already sort of been in the language long enough that we know that what, we, what somebody else might call poetry, um, you know, we'll call it sense line, and we know that SL is the sort of like base or root um, for those language experts, right? The, uh, the root, um, like a little, piece uh, that we can then go um, and build off of, right, in our, in our language, right? So um, I don't want to get anybody uh, intimidated uh, with this. Um, I know it is intimidating. I know that when you're looking at this, you're like, there's no way I'm ever going to learn like all of this. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, you're not supposed to memorize it. You're just supposed to just know the idea, know this concept that we were um, already building upon in the last class, which essentially has us saying, okay, I know that that's a title. And then I can use this list that I have here to say, okay, what's a chapter title? I can actually, you know, using um, the, the search, I can say, okay, what's chapter title? Oop, can't type today, right? Um, and then you'll see, oh, look at that, chapter title is CT, and then you can just make those connections. It will take you some time as you're doing this. It's not gonna come um, um, like naturally right away, unless you've like worked in HTML or something like that, where um, we've actually taken some of some of um, you know the HTML tags and and uh, called the styles after those. But there is a logic behind um, the way that each uh, tag, each style is called. So you know that will build, right? So again, I don't want anybody to feel like frightened or um, or just worried that they're not going to get all of this just because it takes time. It's not something that's, um, you know, you can learn from one day to the next. Um, and as I mentioned, even we here at Scribe often, you know, we'll be like, oh, wait, I know that there's a style for this, but we'll refer back to this, um, to this um, reference. So this is available for you. And we've already linked in the chat the abbreviated one. So that way you don't have to go through each and every one of these uh, items um, in this list. We've made it a little bit easier uh, for you guys to sort of um, begin to experiment with the SAI. So uh, let me just confirm something. I'll go back here and get out of the SML list. And so the next thing is that what I'll show you is that there is a process to composition, and that's what we're going to be learning today. I'm not going to teach you everything about composition just because um, we feel like if we were to do that, it would be a much, much longer demo. Um, and also, it's something that um, we feel is better that you learn with practice and you learn as you're um, as you're just going along with your projects. Um, and you can always contact us with questions uh, and concerns, as we've mentioned before, and as you've heard in previous classes, uh, even if you are composing something yourself um, and you're saying like, oh, I really don't know what this is, you can always shoot us an email or even um, even better, uh, email the whole um, the, or the Google group, um, and we'll respond and let you know, like, okay, look, this looks like this to us. Um, and if we're certain, we'll tell you that's what it is. And if we're like, hey, no, you should really go back to the author, but we think this is what it is. Um, you know, you'll always receive uh, an answer so you're not out there, like, floating um, alone, right, uh, while, you're, while you compose. So, again, um, as you heard, um, we are going to be talking, and we're going to start talking in SCML, if you want to talk, think of it that way. Uh, but if at any point something is confusing or anything like that, please feel free to chime in. I can't actually see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. I can, but it's, it's a little bit 
different. So I think, um, Mike, you can monitor that and answer questions if, if they come up or interrupt me and um, point me to where people are in confusion. So I'll leave that to Mike. Okay. So um, as you can see, this documentation is also available for you. Um, and this tells you, this is from our site on scribenet.com. Um, and you will see uh, that there is actually a pattern and a pretty quick way to sort of get your idea around what uh, composition is. So you'll have, you know, you'll apply the template, you'll check for graphics and all that stuff, which we'll actually go through um, now together. So uh, we're in our demo document again. Um, and so the first thing that you want to do is you want to, as we saw in that, uh, that demo, we want to apply the SML template. So this is our SAI, uh, as we've already installed. Um, and over here, you'll have some editorial um, tools, but you don't need to worry about those uh, right now. There is one that will come up or may come up as we go through um, this demo, uh, but you don't need to worry about these right now. And so we won't discuss them um, at length. Um, same thing goes for the convert notes and all that. Um, we can talk a little bit more and I think eventually we'll have a video uh, discussing all of these um, once I get all that approved. But that, that's the case for another day. Uh, but what we will be mainly using is the apply SML template button and that does exactly what it says. Um, if you click on it, which we'll do now, you'll get this pop-up that'll say, would you like to associate the styles in this document with SML styles? So let's say you have a a document that has already has like heading one, heading two, heading three, um, and has some of words like natural or well, not natural, but uh, words like default styles. What you can do is you can actually link those with a scribe style and the SAI will sort of automatically compose that for you. Um, however, in this case, we know that everything is normal. Again, this is why we bet beforehand, sort of connecting everything together that we've learned up to this point, um, because then we'll know, if, okay, this is already sort of styled in a way that I can use that to cut down my, co my composition time, uh, or this is all normal and I'm gonna have to go in and compose things um, as best as I can. So uh, right now we know that this is all normal, so we're gonna hit no. If you hit yes, uh, Word may take a little bit because it's actually loading all the styles uh, from the SML template. Uh, and that's sometimes, depending on your computer, takes a little bit of, uh, of a time. Um, and if your computer is really slow, that might actually, might actually break it. So um, what I would suggest um, is that unless you're absolutely sure that you are, you know, you have your heading ones and your heading twos and everything is composed and this can be helpful to you, um, you know, unless you're absolutely sure, um, hit no. It's, it makes it a whole lot easier, so I would say. No, you'll see that word did a little bit of something there. Um, and that means that the template uh, is actually loading right now. See, it's taking uh, a little bit of time. Um, while that loads, oh, it actually just did. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? No, I think we're okay. What did you get to for it to bring that um, box up with the oh, question? I just yeah, I just hit apply SML template. And okay. when you do that, the default behavior is to bring that box up uh, just because um, we found it when we were programming the SAI that, it, that oftentimes you'll have uh, a document that's already sort of styled and that might save you some time. So we just put that as a yes or no option right okay. at the beginning. So, um, and so yeah, so once you get your document and before you start composing, you apply the SML template. If you don't apply the template, anything that we do from here on in won't work. So that's why that's that uh, first step. The next step is to go through and check the document for, uh, for graphics, for uh, images, um, clip art, or anything like that. There are easy ways to do that. I'll show you just one. There are multiple ways to do this. You can either even scroll through the document. Um, but I'll show you a quick and easy way to do this. Um, and again, I will mention that a lot of the, what we're going to do now, there are other ways to, to do this, even applying styles, but I'm going to show you the best way that is going to avoid sort of any uh, issues or any, uh, any problems. So um, in Word, you can either do it as um, you can bring up the find and replace uh, box uh, in um, Word 2010. Uh, the shortcut is control H, or you can bring up the find box, which is control F. Um, that's often the, the shortcut. Uh, that's on Windows PC, so you'll forgive me if you're on a Mac. I think it would be um, Apple F or, or Apple H, uh, depending on 
uh, your system. So um, here you would want to hit um, the caret character and then the letter G and that'll hop you right down to the first image. And if there's multiple ones, you'll see them on this bar over here. If you use the control H way, then you can just hit find next. And what you'll want to do with the images, you don't want to leave them in here because Word images in Word, Word compresses all of these images. So they pretty much become uh, useless for print. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have from your author uh, images um, you know, that can be used for print. Now, if these are the only ones that you have, you can save these images out. For now, we'll just remove this um, because uh, we don't want any images before we start uh, composing. Again, because Word compresses them um, and it turn, turns them pretty much into useless for print. It reduces the resolution and the DPI. There's a whole bunch of stuff to it. So I'm just gonna go ahead, I just hit delete. Um, and what I want to do is like, I know that there's an image that's supposed to be there. so. Remember how I mentioned that there was one thing that you'll need from this editorial uh, section. Um, it's this insert query option, the little Q. If you click on it, you'll see at the bottom, don't worry about the three above it, but you'll see at the bottom, that there's one that says I am. If you click on that, it'll bring up this dialog box that'll tell you to give this figure that you just deleted uh, a name. Um, I'm currently right where I deleted the image. So I'm just gonna call this OTN demo fig01.jpg, right? Um, that's just a sample. Um, if you have actual figure, figure names, you can put those in. And if you hit OK, you'll see that the SAI automatically created this little sort of placeholder text. Um, and what this does, it actually already composed it for you as image, right? And I don't believe it composes it as fig, but give me one moment while I move this little bar out of the way and I'll switch into draft view. Yeah, it automatically composes it as fig, which stands for figure. And what this will do is that it will let the typesetter know when you're at that stage that a figure goes here and the name of the figure where they can go and pull it from, uh, pull from wherever you have it stored and say, okay, I know that I gotta place this high res image in the typeset file here. This will get carried out throughout all uh, conversions. So, any questions up to this point? No? Okay, so now I'll show you how to actually use the SAI to apply uh, styles. Um, in our documentation, we suggest that you compose uh, part uh, and chapter titles and heads first. The reason why is because you'll notice that there are some italic, um, italic words here. I believe there's some bolding later on, um, or there might not be. Um, and so if you go ahead and compose, um, for example, this line, and you compose it, let's say, we'll compose it as P, right? Don't worry, I'll show you guys this in a moment. And say I compose it as P, notice that the italics all went away. And so uh, you don't want to compose like actual paragraphs uh, until you've done the rendering portion. And we'll get to that. I just wanted to give you that as a heads up and as, as an explanation of why you'll see that we're gonna compose our um, our titles and our heads first. Um, also, Control Z will be your friend because um, that allows you to undo things quickly. Um, so you know, do not be afraid to while you're composing to like mess up, especially in the beginning. Oftentimes, that's how we learn. Uh, but it's always good to you know have Control Z handy and say, "Oh no, I did not mean to do that," and you know, hit Control Z and then start uh, continuing on. Uh, with your with your composition, uh, but let's say um, you are composing. As you compose, the best thing to do is to keep, especially as you, in the beginning, is to keep backups of your files. You know, just like you know, copy the document and put a date on it, so that way you know um, that that's a file file, but it's there just in case, like you know, something happened and you know, text got removed or anything like that. You have something to go back to. This I'm just sort of tying everything together with what we've discussed before. Always assume the worst um, when it comes to like backups and, and saving and all that stuff because your computer, like for example, Word tends to crash, right? It's just a quirk of it. Um, and if you've saved backups, you won't lose a lot of work. Um, you never want to lose more than like about five minutes of work. So, um, you know, save your file often, keep backups as much as you are able to, 
Um, and again, this is just our recommendation uh, from very painful experiences that we've all had here at Scribe. And uh, Michael can tell you a little bit more about those uh, later. So I'll let you know um, now um, how to actually use the SAI to uh, compose. So again, remember our concept that we're thinking, okay, what are we calling these things? We're calling these things based on what they are, not what they look like. When we discussed in class, we said, okay, this is a half title, right? Um, that's the original word. That's why uh, Michael brought up like the origins of the half, um, half title. So we know that this is our half title, right? If we were to look at our SML list, I won't bring that up now, we know that there is a tag called BKHT, for that, which stands for book half title, right? At that point, what you know is, okay, I know I need to make this BKHT. So you'll go over here to style galleries, little rainbow wheel over here, and you'll have different options. You'll have common character styles, which that is default. The uh, that is the default style gallery that is uh, loaded in with the S uh, with the SAI. You can create your own via this option here. I'm not going to show you that um, right now, um, but what I will show you is that you can load essentially default galleries that we've already created. Uh, for you and all of these correspond to the SCML list. So if you have the SCML list open and you know that something should be a book half title, you can look at it and say, okay, I know that the SCML tag is BKHT. So I'm going to go in and load default gallery, right? And I know that the um, book half title is in the front matter. So I'll go ahead and click front matter. You'll see that it's highlighted there. And then you'll click OK and it'll bring up this box here. And you can see that it has all the different styles available and they're all conveniently made into buttons. So that way now, whether you've selected the line or you've just have your cursor there, you can go and find BKHT, which is number three here, click on that. And now that is composed as BKHT. Does that make sense to everyone up to this point? Are we all okay? Good, good. I see nodding heads. Um, and so, what we're gonna go through now is we're just gonna go ahead and do this um, and we're gonna apply this to all our heads um, and our titles. So you can have multiple style galleries open. So I know that I'm gonna be using heads later on. So I'll go here to style galleries, low default galleries, and I'm gonna, and this is alphabetical after the numbered list. So um, I know I'm gonna look for heads. We have a handy dandy name here uh, for heads. I'm gonna go ahead and click on it and hit okay. And now I have these two style galleries uh, available. Now, um, this can get sort of cumbersome if you have multiple style galleries. But remember that you can always close out of them and reload them um, as you need them. Um, and like I said, um, in a, probably a, another video or something else, we'll, we'll show you how to create the style galleries um, for your own use. For, for, so for example, if you're looking at a book that already has um, that you know the structure and you know more or less the styles that you're going to use, you can create your own style your own style gallery and just have that open rather than having to load um, and unload uh, the style galleries. Um, so for now, we're just going to go through the document and we're going to say, okay, this is, and now I'm just going to use my years of experience at Scribe. So if you have, if you're wondering how come I know something, um, it's just practice. It's not natural knowledge. So um, I know that this is a series title. So um, the reason because of that is just because it's, you see, you can read it and say also available by scribe and you'll have a list of books here. It's just, they're just labeled as book one through book two. So I'm going to go ahead. You can either highlight the whole, the whole line or just place your cursor, as I said before. And here in the front matter style gallery, I see that there is S-E-R-T, which stands for um, series title. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And you'll see that the font changed, it grew in size, all that. Um, that, again, is just rendering. We've decided to do this so that way it's easier for, um, for somebody at a glance to know what something is. Um, you'll see later on uh, when we run the rendering option um, that uh, like italic becomes green, bold becomes pink, and things like that. Again, those will not carry over, that the, that rendering does not carry over uh, into design and typeset. That's just for us as a sort of easy way to differentiate how some, that something is styled. Because if you can look at it this way, if you are uh, composing 
something as bold or, or italic, it's kind of easy to lose it in the big blocks of text. Meanwhile, um, if you have it highlighted in that green or that pink, it's easy to say, oh, hey, that actually shouldn't be italic or that actually shouldn't be bold and so on and so forth. So we'll continue on and now we're at the title page. And so I know that this is the book title. So the SEML for book title is BK, right? And so I click on that and now this is um, BK and you'll see it here in this view. By the way, um, as, you, um, as you guys experimented with a word, I don't know if everybody has this style area with uh, this style area pane available. Um, after the demo, if you don't have it available, once we're uh, playing around and stuff, um, either Mike or I will show you how to get that um, available. And so, uh, Karen, I just want to make sure, are we still good on time or, or should we? We're good. Okay. Good. So then we'll um, take this next one and this is the subtitle. And so now you'll see that there's this BK1. One often indicates um, in a in SEML, uh, one, two, three, or any number in an SEML tag or, or in an SEML style, um, indicates either a sub item or it indicates an alternate item. And so um, I'll link it after the demo, but there are certain spacing rules and certain things that we won't discuss in the demo just uh, for the sake of time, uh, but they are available. You'll also notice that I'm saying there's a lot of things that we won't discuss in the demo. Uh, that shows you that composition is a bit complex, but again, it is not something um, totally foreign, right? It's something that you can, um, you can grasp. Um, just because it's um, complex doesn't mean it's too difficult. It just takes some time. It takes some time sort of shifting the mentality. I believe uh, Sonny had mentioned it uh, in the last class, just shifting that mentality from like looking at something and saying, well, it looks like this and then, but it should be this and thinking like that. So um, that idea of just labeling something as what it is, is a good foundation for everything that builds upon that. And there's no possible way for us to sort of, teach you everything in one shot, but again, you're not going to be alone. Your team or anything like that, we are here uh, to help. So this subtitle um, or the second title of this book, right, is BK1. So I'll go here and apply BK1. And here, we can treat Scribe as the publisher of this. This will have no author. So there is a style called BK Pub, right? And you'll see that over here, that's number four. And that just stands for book publisher. We click on that and you'll see how we have things centered and it starts almost looking like it would in a book. And that's intentional. That's to, to sort of get our minds into thinking like, okay, this is how you know BK Pub will look like. It'll be centered. It'll be smaller than the other two, um, BK One and BK, and so on and so forth. And so, I'll close out of these just because there's. I'll bring up the front matter again. So here, you'll see that you'll have this copyright uh, text information. We have a style called CRT for copyright text, um, and we actually also have a style for the special differentiation that we give to Library of Congress publication data, which we call CIP because it's cataloging in publication. Um, so you'll start noticing that SCML, you know, the tags make sense that they are either abbreviations of what they are or they, you know, are, you know, some kind of, for, like they're, they refer in some way to what we would normally call it if we were just speaking uh, plain English. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to compose this whole section, but, you know, we don't want to go in and do it like one by one, right? So if you have a block of text that you know what it is, for example, all of these are going to be CRT and we're going to add the F distinction to those uh, just because F gives you a little bit of space above every, um, every line that's composed as CRTF. Again, spacing distinctions you don't have to worry too much about right now, um, especially because the hub takes care of a lot of them. It won't take care of this one. Uh, so that's why I'm mentioning it, mentioning it now, but I will send you the link that sort of explains um, the F, L, and S, which stands for first, last, and standalone um, um, modifiers for um, the SCML tag. So we'll go ahead and say, we're going to select everything, go back to our style gallery, load our default style gallery, 
we're still in the front matter, so we can select the front matter uh, pre-created uh, style gallery. And you'll see that number nine here is CRTF, right? And so we'll go ahead and click on that and you'll see that it composed everything that you selected, right? So as you can see, as you're, as you're composing, you don't have to go line by line by line. If you use, um, you know, if you select text judiciously, you can actually um, go ahead um, and uh, compose entire, um, entire blocks of text. There's actually other little tools that the SAI uh, has that will allow you to um, compose things a little bit more automatically, but we won't discuss those uh, for the sake of this demo. They are available and I will point you to documentation about it. Uh, so again, I mentioned that we give special uh, treatment to the catalog and publication data uh, or CIP. We don't just call it like regular copyright text. So what we'll do is we'll call that CIPF because we want to maintain that space above. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, click on number seven here and you'll notice that it changed. It looks, it renders the same, but as we were discussing in Mike's overview of the, um, of that typeset sample, sometimes things look the same, but they are structurally different. Um, so I just wanna show you just really quickly why the spacing distinctions are important. If I were to take this block of text and they're all CRT, notice we lost all our spacing. And the typesetter is not gonna know, um, you know, that, hey, these should be spaced out, you know, so that they are each uh, with a little bit of space above. And you might say, well, why can't I just use, um, you know, uh, a carriage return or a paragraph break there to indicate the space? The thing is, is that blank paragraphs um, in the well-formed document workflow and really throughout, like when you convert from Word to any kind of um, computer language like XML or anything like that, blank lines are just blown away. So if you're using blank lines to indicate certain things, that's why we created these modifiers like the first, the last, and the standalone to um, sort of preserve that information without actually having to preserve the blank lines, which aren't preserved anyway. So again, I'll use my friend Control Z, and now we've, comp we've composed our, um, our copyright page, right? So we'll look down to this next section, and you'll notice that I'm, I'm ignoring like all the other blank lines and all that because that will get um, blown away um, later on. So um, I know that this is a dedication. Um, the reason I know is just because um, if you read it, it says to everyone. So you'll, having read books throughout your entire lives, you'll see that there's, uh, you know, to my mother, to Billy, to so-and-so. Uh, and we know that those, we call those dedications. So um, inscribe, uh, at scribe, excuse me, um, you'll, call them dedication, we have the style DED, which is an abbreviation for dedication. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on DED, and now that is composed. Um, and so, we'll continue on. So now we get into the actual, to an actual sort of chapter, right? The, and we treat the table of contents as if it were a chapter in the book, right? And so we'll need to now go to, we'll close out of this, go to style galleries, load default galleries, right? and go down to parts and chapters. And that'll give us a style gallery that has all the chapter uh, titles, um, all the part titles, uh, part numbers, chapter number, all those styles available. Again, you can create your own um, gallery as, um, as a sort of advanced user later on. So we know that the table of contents, right? We're gonna treat this like a chapter. So the first thing in the chapter is that chapter title. But this chapter title is special because it's still part of the front matter. And often um, in books, you'll treat the uh, chapter titles that are in the front matter a little bit differently than you would treat the chapter titles that are in, um, in the main part of the book uh, or even the back matter for that, uh, for that matter. So we have a style called chapter title FM, right? C-T-F-M, so chapter title front matter. Right, and so that just tells us it's a chapter title in the front matter. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And there you go, and that's composed. And so you'll see that you get into sort of a rhythm as you're looking at this and you're saying, oh, I know what that is, so I can call it this. I know what that is, I can compose it as this, so on and so forth. So here um, in the beginning, we're gonna go back and open up another style gallery and go to load default gallery. Uh, front matter, I believe, has TLC. Yes, it does. There you go. And by the way, if at any moment you're like, I know what this should be, but I don't know what style gallery it, it's in, remember that this is keyed exactly 
like the SCML list. So the SCML list serves as a reference for you to say, okay, I know that this should be DIA for dialogue, which we'll see later on, um, at, but I don't know where that is. I don't know if there's a dialogue uh, gallery. So you'll look it up and you'll see that um, the galleries that are in the SAI are keyed exactly to the SCML, um, SCML list. So um, here we have the um, table of contents. And so each line in the table of contents is something um, is not a regular paragraph. It's not a list. We treat it as something special. We treat it as something different because it structurally is something different. It's not, it's a special kind of list if you think of it that way. Um, but it's not just a list. So here we'll take this and we'll say, okay, this is the first level in the table of contents. And so there is the TOC style. So I'm going to go ahead and click TOC. And you'll see that it changed the font, uh, changed some of the spacing, and it labeled it as TOC here. Now these are part of the, are subheads, right, underneath the introduction. And so they are in the second level under um, that first level of the table of contents. So you'll want to go ahead and click on TOC1. Remember, we start at zero, so we start with nothing, and then one would be the sub item. Um, and if you have um, other, um, like further sub, uh, sub items, you have TOC2, TOC3, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and make this TOC1. And here, we're going to go ahead and make this TOC. Now that would be fine, right? However, the preface and the index are actually part of the front matter and back matter respectively, right? So you have to, we have more specific terms that we can use, more specific um, styles. So for the preface, right, which we actually don't have in the sample, but it's here in the table of contents, we would call that TOC FM, FM for front matter. So see that same idea as CTFM, you see it here again. So we're gonna go ahead and change this and so if you like, let's say made a mistake like I just did and say, okay, I just called that TLC, but I now have to uh, undo. You don't have to undo if you, it's, if you know exactly what you're changing and it's only a you know, one line change or anything like that. So you'll go ahead, select the text and then click TLC FM and you'll see that it changes um, automatically. So it overrides whatever uh, style you had there before. So. Um, we know that the index is part of the back matter, so TOC, BM for back matter. And so now we'll get into an actual chapter. And so I'm going to leave over this uh, part section, all right? Leave that open. And we'll go back to just composing like these special titles and all this. So we'll say CN for chapter number. CT for chapter title. And we're gonna leave this alone because we're still gonna focus just on those heads. I just wanted to give you an example of some uh, special styles up here. So we're just gonna focus on the heads. So I'm gonna just scroll through and I'll be able to tell that something is a head just based on the fact that it's often short. Um, often they'll have some sort of formatting like here it's italicized and the TLC sort of indicates to you, hey, wait a second, these are underneath um, this introduction, so they must be subheads, right? So I'm gonna go here to style galleries, and then go ahead and go load default galleries, and click on heads, and hit okay, and that'll bring up the heads style gallery. And we'll go through and just compose all of our heads, and say, because we know as we're imagining that we know, but we've vetted this, right? All our heads are italics here, uh, are in italic, excuse me. So uh, what you'll want to do is you'll say, I don't need to preserve that because if all my heads are italics, then I know that I can apply italics to the head style and it will automatically make um, all um, my heads or all my A heads italic in the design or in the typeset. So um, here you don't have to worry so much about that idea of like losing um, the italics, especially if it's applied to the entire line. So we'll go here and again, click on the line and a head, a head, just because it's a subhead. And I believe we have one more. There it is. 
And again, I've vetted this, quote unquote, so I know where they are. Um, that's why it's important to look at the file before you even start work. You don't want to start work on a file you don't know what you're going to run into uh, later on. Right? And so we'll take a look. And this actually also gives us a little bit of a preview and say, hey, look at that. There's terms. And that should be an A head as well. Um, and that'll give us sort of a view of like what we can expect as we compose specific paragraph style. So we'll go back and we see that the heads match up with what we have here in the table of contents. Okay, so once you've composed all your heads, what you want to do is you want to go here to clean up. And Karen, are we running out of time? I see you're unmuted. Um, we should probably transition just to make sure we have enough time in the next couple minutes. Okay, okay. So then we'll just end here and we can probably continue uh, in the next class. I think we have some time of some time there for the more specifics, but this should give you a good idea. I think everybody has a good idea of like how to apply a style. Yes. Uh, any questions or any worries or doubts, fears, concerns. Okay. So the one, the last thing that we'll use um, is this rendering option. So you'll see there's a lot of options here in cleanup. We won't go through them now just for the sake of time, but rendering what that will do, it will go through your entire document and any uh, word formatting, for example, underline, italic, bold, um, and I believe um, footnotes and endnotes, does, um, it will also do that as well, um, the references. Uh, it will actually go ahead and apply the styles automatically for you. So you don't have to go hunting for each italic and select it and then make it italic and so on and so forth. So we're going to go ahead and click on rendering. We'll leave everything else unchecked because we're not going to um, worry about that right now. And then we'll go ahead and click OK. You'll see that. Um, It'll go a little bit crazy, and then you'll have um, this little dialog box come up that says cleanup complete. Once it does that, you'll see that now what was italic is green, and you won't be able to see it over on this bar, but over on this option here, and I know that not everybody has that. I can also show you how to get that later on. Um, you'll see the actual character style, and you'll see that that is I for italic up here in this tiny little space. I don't know if the screen is large enough for, for everybody to see. But we'll just look quickly up here. And you'll see that all these that were italic are also now green, which indicates to us that they are composed as italic. Um, and so I guess with that, we can. this is a good stopping point before we get into um, actually um, composing um, the special paragraphs. Um, the one thing I will note, um, and we'll note this again for your homework, you do not need to compose regular paragraphs. So anything that you would label as P, you do not need to compose that, and we'll tell you about that why in the next class. So I'll pass it over uh, to Karen. Just want to double check, um, even though Elvis asked, are there any questions about what he just demoed for you? Could be technical questions, could be philosophical questions, like why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pretend that somebody asked, why are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and just take a step back to um, acknowledge the differences in this particular process with what many of us are familiar with in terms of one-touch online publishing, um, and that um, there are tools that automate some of this stuff for us um, when working in WordPress, for example, or another tool. And um, so, I sometimes think of the partnership with Scribe and the co-op process as a middle path between like making it all about tech and a publishing platform or and bringing more people sort of into the mix um, of that process. So, you know, there are many publishing programs that um, give an author a tool and the author uses that tool um, to his or her advantage and publishes a great um, work using that tool. This obviously is different, um, and I would say it also um, provides an alternative for more people to be involved in the process, and usually that means a stronger product. Um, so this workflow isn't just about like, you know, using Word, which most, um, which many faculty authors are very comfortable in, but it's also about setting up the structure of a document so that many people down the line um, sort of have that shared language and can, as Mike has said, typeset it or design it 
Um, you're really marking up this document to communicate with other people on a team to make this better. And in the process, you're talking to your author about their intention, which is also probably going to lead to a stronger product. Asking those questions about, is this what you meant? Is this how you want to structure your chapters? You know, what are you trying to do with this text for your student learners is, I think, just inherent in that process is going to make for a better product because you're bouncing ideas around with somebody. You're, you're having a conversation about this textbook. You're not working in isolation um, and then sort of putting it out there and learning um, afterwards maybe what is or isn't working, which again is another totally viable um, process. I'm just trying to highlight kind of why this publishing pathway has its own strengths. Um, and acknowledge that you are really deep into this document in ways that you might not be with other publishing pathways. So um, I really value a um, beautifully designed reading experience. You know, in an earlier session, we talked about like why we like a particular instructional book that we looked at together and almost all of us agreed. It supported our learning process. There was white space. It was beautiful. You know, it had these, these um, features to it that benefit the reader but I think also often um, make the faculty author feel that their ideas and their lessons are being communicated um, in a way that really highlights um, their teaching and potentially their research. So I know we just had a very uh, sort of technical demonstration about SDML and using um, SAI toolbar, but I just wanted to step back and say like, as a reminder, here's why we're doing this. Here's why we wanted to offer this particular pathway. And again, by structuring the document in this way, you're setting it up for copy editors and proofreaders and other professionals to make it a really killer um, product that, um, that reflects also your publishing program in addition to a commitment to student learning and highlighting faculty work. So, um, Sorry, I thought I heard maybe a comment or question. Um, I will also just again say that um, something unique about this publishing pathway is that individualized project support that Elvis has mentioned, both in terms of um, giving you feedback on your project and on this actual process of composition. So what we would like to do now is really um, have, some, have some supported time for you to try doing what Elvis just did. Um, continuing on in the document. So I think what we want to do is toggle back to um, the document you were working on when we went into our breakout groups before. Um, so starting around page nine of uh, that document, there should be a phrase, mourning for the sins of mankind. Um, if you can find that phrase, why don't you try for the next quiet, uh, five minutes, um, giving it a shot and composing um, on your own using SAI. And then we will um, let you know when those couple minutes are up and then we'll regroup and see how it went. How does that sound? Yeah? Okay. Uh, if you have any trouble, uh, we're obviously not going anywhere. We'll be here. But otherwise, I'm just going to um, start a five minute um, timer, so to speak, and then we'll um, come back. Okay, composers, it's been about five minutes. How was it for you? <laughs> it was nice to have done the first round, uh, you know, getting a little bit of a sense of warrior headers and um subtitles would go so mm -hmm. yeah so that was very helpful the okay. first exercise was very helpful good to hear thanks sunny yeah i thought even though we were you know prompted to start with that morning for the sins part kind of halfway through i wanted to begin at the beginning like making sure i was thinking about it correctly from the beginning and not to start applying the styles there just so that there would be the consistency throughout. Great. And the front matter is complicated. There's a lot going on there. So if that was your uh, your impulse to start there, then that's yeah. awesome. I, I didn't worry about the details on the front matter. I just kind of 
I just wanted to see where the chapters were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same. Methodology, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Well, it was, it took me a while to get back to the, you know, um, it helps to go from the course material where it has the list of the types of elements, you know, and then you hit headings and then it goes to the right part of that list because I can't function until I know that list a little bit better. This isn't, you know, I need to know which style guide, style, what are they called? Style gallery to go to, you know, mm -hmm. and so. Mm -hmm. Because there was one on the exercises, you know, the the quiz. So there's a special style gallery for that under curriculum. <laughs> you have to find it. Okay. Yes. Well, great. Maybe um, Elvis will pull it back up, and then we can look at it together and see if there was consistency across the group. You know how people mark things, why they mark them a certain way, and we can um, just talk a little bit more about what you guys decided. I think everyone can see my screen, yes? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So maybe we can get some consensus and see um, what are we calling the morning for the sins of mankind? Or what would it be composing it as to use the proper terminology? Yeah, everyone's very quiet. There are no wrong answers. <laughs> So I um, was relying on like thinking about what the author had selected mm -hmm. with the heading structure and so okay. tried to follow that to some degree. So for this, uh, I had it as a chapter, chap, subsec, the chapter subsection. Okay. So you, you uh, I had, go ahead. Um, heading one or mm -hmm. Or yeah, all of the heading ones were a chapter section. Although then I thought maybe that's a chapter title. Um, mm -hmm. So right at the last bit of the five minutes, I sort of got myself confused about when I was using chapter section versus chapter title. Mm -hmm. um, or yeah, so but I had that as a chapter section. The two blessed are those who mourn, and then mourning, okay, not worldly troubles. Wait, maybe I'm at the wrong place here. Let's see. Oh, that would have been, yeah. Sorry, that's right. Okay. So, so you use the CHC, S, S E C T style, chapter sec? Or did you use, what style did you use? Yeah, so I used that in the heads gallery, mm -hmm. the okay. C H S E. CT. CT. Mm -hmm. And then I also used that was for heading two. I don't know. Let me see. Now I can't see because I already changed a lot of them. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, for heading two, I did C H S E C T. Mm -hmm. And for heading three, C H S U B E C T. Yes. Yeah, the really long one. So, um, so that's actually a good way of, of thinking it. But we would have gone with something a little bit simpler uh, just because we often use chapter section and chapter subsection. Um, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's often for like, you know, Bibles and other uh, like, yeah, other like really complex ones. So when you're looking at a manuscript, uh, especially this, because this we're trying to make it look like a textbook, but this is really a monograph. So um, in this in this case, um, your thinking was in the right place of like chapter section, and subsection. But what we would have done is we would have gone with um, a head and b head, um, just because that's the simpler level of the of the headings. Once you get into chapter section, subsection, that's more for like Bibles, which often are kind of crazy to compose. So. Um, so yeah, so actually, so good thinking on a head and on chapter section and subsection, but we would have gone with, uh, let's make this, where are you? Uh, we would have made this since it's a heading two, and also very good pointing out the, the fact that you saw that the author had, you know, labeled things more or less consistently. So you could go off of that and you can trust that. So we would have probably called this one morning uh, for the sins of mankind as a behead, right? And so... 
Um, so like we said, we're not composing the regular paragraphs and that's what these are as we've discussed in the break rooms. Um, so we would also have done behead for uh, foolishness to the world, wisdom to God. So we'll skip down here to this section here. And so we'll start at the beginning. Um, what would we have composed here? The section that says uh, quiz one. I decided to make it a, a box. Okay. So I said it's a box head. Okay. I found the curriculum under curriculum. There was the exercise head. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. So there you have another one of those things where it's like you're looking at it and the rest of the text around it sort of leans both ways because it could be a box. You know, it could be like just set off by itself or it could be an exercise. We would have leaned towards exercise just because it's more interactive. Boxes and sidebars, we usually treat those like little bits of information or things that are pertinent to the main text, but not, you know, part of the running text. This we can actually treat um, as part, uh, as an exercise. So, um, so we'll go with exercise uh, for now, but box isn't necessarily wrong. And so in this case, what you would want to do is you would want to say, okay, go back to the author and say, do you want to treat all your quizzes as if they're like little sidebars at the end, or do you want to um, just treat them as part of the uh, main text as if they were just exercise. So we'll go over to the curriculum gallery, right? And so we'll say that this is EXH. And so that would then make this list. Can somebody tell me what this would be? I just did EX on it. Okay, so you went with EX, which is good, but you can be more specific. I mean, I tried the first and then it looked weird, so I... Okay. Just went with all EX. <laughs> EX. Okay. So see, that wouldn't be um, that wouldn't be wrong in the sense of like, okay, you know, that's not what this is because it is part of the exercise. But because we have those EX NLs, right, which are exercise numbered list, and that's in that uh, 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 numbered list. I got you. Numbered list. Yep. So you would say, okay, this is a numbered list inside an exercise. So I would probably go with EX NL, and you'll see that that. Uh, okay. And even if it looks a little bit let's say a little bit funky, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. It just means that the formatting is set up in such a way. Uh, but remember, formatting um, in Word, at least, is not something that's going to carry over. What's going to carry over is what you're calling it. So in this case, um, EX and L. But see, had you gone through and made all of the EX lines just EX, that's actually a real easy fix to go from EX to EX and L um, rather than, and I'll show um, how, I'll show how to do that later on, um, but um, it's just easier to do that than to now say, okay, these were sidebars, these were EX, these were BX, and these were something else. Okay, so the next one, um, Discourse 2, and I think uh, we'll probably get down to maybe right before the key terms and then um, conclude since we're running out of time. This is the one that Sunny and I have problems with because okay. we think it's like the highest chapter head level, but in in what the author has left it at normal. So mm -hmm. God knows what it is. Okay. Okay. Actually, you are right in that it's the highest level. It's just that the author has neglected. Uh, in this case, I have purposely put that in there to, to mess with people's heads. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it accomplished its, its job. But the truth is, is that oftentimes you'll have an author who is very consistent with certain things, but won't be consistent with something else. So um, this is a sort of a, a, a test in, in, in that kind of thinking and looking at it and saying, okay, I have to read a little bit of this and say, okay, this seems like the like highest level. Um, you guys were actually on the, on the right track. So this is actually the chapter title, right? So if all the other headings come below it, so you have your A heads or B heads and so on, uh, this then becomes uh, your chapter title, even though the author left it as normal and it looks like just everything else, uh, structurally, it's the chapter title. So we'll go ahead and make that chapter title. So again, style galleries, no default galleries, and then go to a parts and chapters. And then we'll call that chapter title, right? But actually, there is something here. If that's the chapter title, then what makes this the title to come part of it 
But that's part of the epithet. You could think of it that way. Or where we would like to go is <laughs> you see the colon here? So it's the subtitle. That, mm. It's the subtitle, right? So you can either do that and say, see, this is the subtitle, chapter title, subtitle. Or if you see later on that all of these say like discourse, one, two, three, and they're all consistently, that way you could actually go with this uh, pair and say, this is CN and this is CT. So that would all depend upon how you want to treat those things. So we'll say that this is CT and CS for the sake of uh, uh, simplicity. So then that leads us to this final one here. What would we call that? I, I, that one I just called epigraph. Epigraph, correct. Well, yeah. But no, go ahead. Give your, your, your theory, your explanation. You are right. Would it need to be EPS for standalone? The, you wouldn't use that because you have the space, the, um, the chapter si subtitle, but good question. The chapter subtitle um, has enough space below so you don't have to have that. You'll, you'd end up creating too much space in between those. Um, but um, that is a good way of, of sort of thinking, of leading us to think about um, the idea of articulation, which is, I'll link that, actually link that now. Um, but it's a good way to, to think how those work together. Now, when you're composing, you can let the hub actually do that articulation for you. You don't have to um, like take the guesses at it. Um, or would it be EP ha aft? Because it's after a... See, that's the thing. Like Mike got that probably answer that one a little bit better because I know that that's in typesetting. It gets a little, little funky. Usually we just leave it as uh, EP or actually we sometimes do EPF, but Mike, I'll, I'll give that while I, I'll give that to you while I link the, uh, the articulation spec. Right. Um, and I wish I had a better answer um, mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of it really depends on how epigraphs are used in the whole book as how the typeset's going to be set up. Um, like if they're all, if they all look like this, they're all one line. Um, I've seen them go through SEP mm -hmm. by themselves without any uh, articulation. Um, but if some of them are going to be sing single paragraphs and some of them are going to be multiple paragraphs, that's really when you get into the need to be very consistent with your articulation so that um, the first paragraph of a multi-paragraph multi epigraph is handled properly. But if all the paragraphs are single, all the epigraphs are single paragraphs, <laughs> then uh, 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 it's generally all right as long as they're, again, all consistent. So I hope that helps. Yeah. There are some styles where it's, it's, as long as you're consistent, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah, and consistency um, is really the greatest virtue you can have when you're composing for all the reasons that uh, Elvis went over. So, Karen? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us on this technical adventure and diving into um, the Scribe add-in and the STML list. Um, you are uh, composing documents, and that is awesome. So we have three meetings left, and the next meeting uh, next Wednesday is uh, still focused on being a composer. And to prepare for that meeting, we would like you to please continue working in this same document. This is your homework document. And give it a go, try to compose the rest of it, please. And then we will spend um, a good chunk of time at the start of our next meeting um, talking through it as we um, did just now, and just sort of exploring the thinking behind it, why you chose um, something over another. And in the process, of course, you'll become more familiar with the style galleries, and um, referencing the um, textbook elements SCML list and just working with that toolbar. Are there any questions before we adjourn? <laughs> I like the facial expressions. 
<laughs> I like hearing your voices, but in, if, if I'm not going to hear any voices, seeing your faces is delightful. Okay, well, uh, please remember if you're pulling your hair out that you can uh, email the listserv uh, between now and next week and get some support that way. And until then, uh, thanks for joining us and see you soon. Oh, and I, yeah. Well, this is sort of just my personal one where I was not understanding the difference between using press books uh -huh. and this. I, I now understand this is its own system. Uh -huh. So for press books, where would this piece of composing happen? I mean, you're still doing that same kind of, you know, designating what's what. Well, yeah, it's a great question. Press books, um, since it's not involving typically, well, I guess it depends on your workflow. And if there are teams of people working in press books with you, for example, a proofreader, a copy editor, um, they're probably going to have their own workflow for deciding um, how each chapter looks, or if you will, composing it, even though I don't think anyone would use that terminology but it would probably be based on a style guide. And so whoever's sort of touching the press books um, textbook last would um, probably want to use a style guide to be sure that the chapters are, are formatted um, consistently. The headers, you know, I always use header one for this thing. I always use header two when I go this next level, um, that kind of thing. But there is not a lot of um, flexibility in how it's um, going to display. Um, so if you were to compare, for example, the PDFs that we've been looking at in the cooperative with an automatically generated PDF from Pressbooks, they're different products. Um, but this particular process is, um, to my comment earlier, not one that you would need to engage with in Pressbooks. Um, it's not the, you're not setting it up to work with the team um, in the way that you are at Scribe. Does that help? The other, um, the other thing okay. is, is when you take this into Pressbooks, uh, depending on the system administrator, you'll have um, specific templates, right? So everything's gonna be rendered a little differently, correct? Um, can you ask that question again, Sunny? Um, if I were to take this content, um, you know, I, I, I would have it, I mean, let's say I would have it marked up to look a certain way. Uh, but if I move the content into a Pressbooks environment, the system administrator would have already set certain, I don't know, for lack, I don't have the right word, visual templates. Right, right. yes, that is right. So that each one is going to render the way the system administrator had selected it to render, as opposed to the way I'm used to it being rendered using um, perhaps the digital hub. It, it, does that make sense? Yes, so I think what Sunny's trying to say is that there are some textbook templates that have different names. Um, Jeremy, maybe you can think of one off the top of your head. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say Great. the the those are the themes, and themes. the themes simply mm -hmm. change colors of the title page of the you know of the titles, or puts a line there, or puts you know some little ding bat somewhere. Uh, but this, this kind of stuff is really not done with the themes. You know, the mm -hmm. themes is just, oh, I like this. It just changes the font and maybe the color of the title chapters or something. Okay. Um, it doesn't do as much as this. It's much more of a simpler, okay, and, and this theme indents the first paragraph, but this theme doesn't that kind of thing. It, it's more minor, superficial, more aesthetic changes to themes. Mm -hmm. You can still then go in and make things heads or paragraphs or lists or that kind of thing. We, even if it's, you know, you, you switch themes, it's still going to be a head and a paragraph and a list. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, I also, just really quickly, I noticed that um, Alvis um, put in a link to um, some documentation about articulation. So, correct. Did that have to do with the epigraph spacing? Question? Yeah, that, that what that will show you that's sort of our explanation 
Um, it's really like quick and like it's short, well, so you can read it at, at, at your leisure. Um, but you'll you'll see that it explains why we use sort of the F, the L, and the S distinctions, first, last, and standalone, um, and why that makes sense within um, the workflow. And that's why I included um, included that in there because it's just you'll hear us refer to something as like pf which is paragraph first or or um has adam asked um should that be eps which would be for epigraph standalone um mm -hmm. but once you understand the idea that standalone adds spacing above and below and you don't want to create too much space then it starts making sense why like that would just be ep versus eps Okay, and that's called articulation. Then. Yeah, no, yeah, we call that. Yeah, we used to call it like spacing distinctions, but I think we we okay. sort of went more with articulation because it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We're totally okay. learning like back office publishing terminology. Before you know it, we're going to all be standing around with drinks and just throwing these phrases around willy nilly. These are great questions. Um, I am conscious of the time, so we should probably wrap up. But if you have other questions, um, please uh, contact us uh, on the Google group or me individually if you're more comfortable that way. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing we want to be doing. It's talking through these differences. So thanks, everyone, for chiming in. All righty. See you soon. Thank you. Bye.